what's up y'all? I'm Captain Adrian Aquino and I'm the EUD Flight Commander here at Hurlburt Field for the 1st Special Operations Civil Engineer Squadron. I'm going to talk to you guys about what an EUD flight typically does and what might make the special in Special Operations Civil Engineer Squadron over here. So we're a 19 person flight. We got 18 airmen, one civilian and EOD we're in charge of, originally we were in charge of dealing with ordnance. So like things like that shell you might have seen out there. Uh, ordnance that's been fired or has been found and we don't know what condition it is in and that's an unsafe uh, hazard and so EOD is responsible for rendering those hazards safe and that has grown ever since its origin to include things like improvised explosive devices, improvised incendiary devices and as well as chemical, biological and nuclear hazards. So like I said EOD this is the Oh, in EOD, this is all the ordnance. Uh, we have all these training aids to help familiarize ourselves with what kind of ordnance is out there. As you can see, there might be US or even Soviet air munitions. Um, things that are important with ordnance is you gotta be able to recognize what's a grenade, what's a rifle, what's a projectile, uh, because these have different kinds of hazards. Uh, these are, for example, landmines, and not every landmine is the same. You might have some that have a tilt rod or some that have an IR sensor, and so, what we go to school for for nine to 12 months is to learn what kind of hazards exist. So you guys are probably wondering, what do we do when we find ordnance? So the first thing you do is you, you get called in and you do a reconnaissance on it. Uh, like my friend is showing you right here. He's trying to check out how long is this thing? How wide is it? What color? What shape? And then he's gonna go into the big ordnance encyclopedia and look it up based on that criteria. And once he finds that, he can identify its name he can identify what's inside of it, what if there's any chemicals that he should be uh, concerned with, uh, how far back he should back up the public if public is involved, or just get all non-essential personnel out of based on its explosive weight. Uh, and most importantly, he can figure out the best way to get rid of it. So when we find an IED the first time uh, we want to encounter it, we probably want to recall that as well, just like a, a piece of ordnance. And so we'll send a robot down, that way we're doing everything as safe and remote as possible. And uh, we got cameras on the robot, there's usually like five or six cameras that you can use to identify, you know, how does the IED work, what potential hazards are associated with that IED, how far should everybody stand back. And you might even be able to make it safe with just the robot. If that robot were to fail or if there was something that would need more delicate, uh, maneuvering or taken care of, we could then suit up on the bomb suit. The bomb suit is uh, kind of a last ditch effort because uh, you, you want to do everything as remote as possible, but sometimes uh, it requires uh, getting down and dirty and getting hands on. And so this is rated to protect up to a certain amount of explosives, nothing crazy, but it is better than nothing. Um, and uh, it weighs about 70 to 80 pounds. so. We do have to be mindful of that when we go down on a problem and it's hot out and you're already stressed out because you're going down on explosives. So this is kind of the mental toughness uh, and physical toughness that comes with the career field. Uh, with that being said, I, I want to thank you all for uh, taking the time to listen. Uh, I hope that this kind of interested all of you. As, a, you, as officers in the making, you should know that to become an EOD officer, you have to be a civil engineer in the Air Force first and once you are there for about two to three years you can apply for EOD school and then you will actually go to the same tech school that all the other EOD techs go to so it's one of the unique opportunities as an officer because you don't always get to do that and so once you become an EOD officer you're still part of a civil engineer squadron you still get to wear the CE badge but you also get to wear the EOD crab as well and it's a super uh, cool experience and I couldn't I, you know I couldn't stress how cool it is uh, with that, guys, thanks again. I wish you luck uh, in the future of your careers. Hey, good morning. My name is uh, Captain Katarina Inouye. I'm a flight surgeon over at Hobart Field. I work for the 1st Special Operations Support Squadron in the Operational Medicine uh, Flight. Um, so I belong to a team of uh, what we call SOFMEs. 
It stands for Special Operations Forces Medical Elements. So we're very much geared towards uh, combat casualty care, or TCCC, uh, which you may have heard of. Um, but we go through an algorithm that covers massive hemorrhage, airway problems, uh, respiration problems, and then uh, circulation or bleeding issues, and then uh, hypothermia and head injury. Those are the types of things we go through, and it's, it's a very much uh, well-known algorithm that we try to go through step by step in M-A-R-C-H. And so that is usually how our bags are set up. We'll have, um, we'll have you know, easy to reach things on our gear too. So we travel with you know, the, the helmet and the bulletproof vest and things like that. We'll have uh, things easy to take off on our uh, person. We'll treat them first with that for any immediate interventions that are needed. And then we'll crack open our bag to get more supplies for the, for the algorithm, the, the um, combat casualty care algorithm. And then we'll also carry uh, drugs to treat any immediate things. Um, like I said, we can, we're capable of treating some uh, critical patients that are you know, not conscious and are requiring hospital level care. Um, a soft me physician is a flight, flight doc, uh, but we are just posted at specific units uh, within the uh, AFSOC community or Air Force Special Operations Command community. Uh, and that's how I became a soft me. I just reached out because I, I knew I was interested in uh, doing soft me work and I reached out to the specific uh, units who had soft me doctors um, and just expressed my interest uh, after I was uh, partway through my intern year as a physician. Yeah. So um, thanks for listening and I hope you guys enjoyed. Hey everybody, I'm Captain Colby Carr. I'm a Special Tax Officer here at the 23rd Special Tactics Squadron. Uh, today I'm going to show you a little bit around uh, from the compound where I work, talk about what I do. Uh, special Tactics is basically the Air Force's ground-based special operations component. And uh, our primary business here is bringing air effects to the ground fight within special operations. So within Special Tactics here at the 2 3, we've got a lot of qualifications that we uh, are able to, to use and maintain. We're all military freefall qualified, uh, combat diving as well. And uh, there's a lot of joint terminal attack controllers, basically the people who uh, bring bombs on target. We also got pararescue men who are uh, trained in technical rescue, which is essentially being able to go up and down things like this, this big climbing wall here or mountains, and, and save people and, and get to people where nobody else can. So this is just some of the, uh, the vehicles and capabilities we have to get to work every day too. Here we have one of our tactical vehicles. We can drive that anywhere uh, off-road. As we move forward here, we've got another capability. It's a little bit smaller though. This one you can actually load into whether it be a plane or CV-22. Um, you know, and that way any, anywhere those platforms can get to, you can still bring one of these to work. Same thing here with these, these mini bikes. You're able to, to jump them if you have to. So, uh, you know, people parachuted with them hit the ground, started one up, and, uh, and gotten going. So here at the 2-3, there's a lot of different ways that you can, you can get to uh, where you need to go to ultimately help, like I said before, bring air effects into the ground fight. So a big part about what makes the 2-3 uh, Special Tactics Squadron and Special Tactics writ large great is the amount of resources and, uh, and personnel dedicated to not just the, the tactical gear and equipment that we have, but to building and strengthening our, our bodies and minds. So we're here in our own, our own gym here on, the, on our compound. We've got uh, every aspect of medicine from strength coaches and physician assistants all the way up to um, licensed clinical social workers and, and doctors and really everything in between uh, here to help us become better. We've got our own chaplain to build our spiritual foundation. And uh, you know, this is just kind of one, one place that we all go to whether we need uh, something to be fixed or something to be strengthened as well. So within Special Tactics and here at the 23rd, uh, whether you're a combat controller, pararescue man, you're conducting uh, special reconnaissance, you're a Special Tactics officer or combat rescue officer, uh, your kit and kind of your first line belt here are the main tools of your trade. And, and you use all these to in some way either conduct uh, precision strike, uh, personal recovery, uh, surveillance reconnaissance, and really full spectrum uh, global access and air ground integration. Thanks for taking a tour of the 2-3 with me today. 
the organization's always looking for uh, highly motivated and uh, complex problem solvers. And uh, all, everything you've seen today is a, is a tool to help you do that better.